I'm really happy to be here. I've never been, uh, been in this part of the province before. Um, beautiful place, and I just have felt really warmly welcomed. I'd like to thank Megan for inviting me to be here, um, and uh, Terry and um, everyone involved with the festival, Paul, for the, the ride from the airport. Um, thanks to all of you for, for being here. Um, one reason why it's wonderful to be reading with Catherine is that uh, we've got animals in common. In fact, some of, this, some of the same animals, um, although these are a little more somber poems and I don't move around as much. I apologize for that in advance. Um, but in terms of subject matter, there is a lot that connects here, and one poem that I'll read later connects in a more specific way. Um, so these are poems, most of my reading will be drawn from um, a page from The Wonders of Life on Earth, which started off as a book about zoos, gradually became a book that was as much about looking as it was about zoos specifically. Um, so questions of home and place and the notion of the collection and how we contain things, how we are ourselves contained, um, those, those issues sort of come up here. So I'm just sort of selecting some of the, the poems from this book, which is itself constructed as a larger kind of meander through different places, including some very old zoos. So I will start with uh, Domesticity Revisited. When they first put a cow in a zoo in Dublin, when the common cat, when a slick giraffe dropped from a stooped giraffe and breathed in a suburb that was home, the dog star, backyard squirrel, birds we do not know the names of. Kids point to the moo cow's nonstop jaw and ask, kids from flats. Yesterday they came, finches or warblers, their breasts purplish as new growth, then gone. This poem is set in the Menagerie in the Jardin des Plantes, which is arguably the world's oldest public zoo um, in Paris and dates from, I believe, 1832 or thereabouts. Because it's a very urban zoo, um, you don't just see sort of families who've driven way out to, to some far-flung area to go there. Um, there are a lot of lone people in that zoo and it feels like it defines the character of, of the zoo in important and lonely ways. Comfort. A Spanish man who rides the metro daily, open-palmed, delivering a discourse on his poverty, puts his face to the chimpanzee's glass. To be in there, warm hay and tires, oranges, and look how the mother presses the young one close. If he took the city by the neck and shook, would the strand break, pearls roll into corners? Underneath the metro runs faces he could spend an hour watching if the earth were made of glass. I found myself, while I was on this tour of various uh, old world zoos, taking a lot of notes um, from things that I overheard, from things that were written on various signs in the zoos, and so a lot of this poem is comprised of found material from those sources as well as from various books, fictional and non-fictional, um, that I was reading as part of my research. Um, it's called An Education, and it begins with a quote um, about zoos in the 19th century. Zoos may have been allowed in parks partly because looking at animals was considered a more moral activity associated with more polite standards of behavior than, for example, going to the theater. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> the animal knows nothing of Malaysia's forest canopy. It roams where it can. Food appears. Sparrows land within the fence and go. Knows nothing of the Serengeti. Food appears, night pivots into day, crowds watch, kids shout, shops sell plastic versions. When it's cold, the door to indoors opens. Secretive by nature, nocturnal in activity, the blank and blank live shrouded in mystery. Pads tread on tiles. Eh, hey, le zèbre! Shit piles up. This hunch scavenger frequents carrion and garbage dumps, but also preys on rats, mice, fish, flamingos, and insects. Blank spent hours nearly motionless. Mr. Giraffe is hosed down. Food appears. Birds land outside the bars, a few feet by a few feet. Watch it not move. Look at the widow raccoon. Buy a palmful of food from the dispenser. Mais il est où? Pourquoi il se cache? Pourquoi il ne bouge pas? Est-ce qu'il est mort? World of darkness, 
world of birds. Blank were found nesting in Central Park. No one is quite sure why they left, but there is work underway to bring them back. It bit me. Wild Asia, the mouse house, vivarium, fauvry, Swiss garden, jardin anglais. Kids come to know the animal outside of pages. Food appears, knows nothing of the Amazon. The enclosure hosed down. Kids come to love. On June 19, 1959, in blank, a blank wolfed down 1,706 peanuts, 1,089 pieces of bread, 1,330 sweets, 811 biscuits, 198 orange segments, 17 apples, seven ice creams, and one hamburger. Nodes nothing. Kids come. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sort of moving on to the kind of art making cluster of poems here. Um, so a couple of poems that touch on um, a tapestry in the Cloisters Museum, um, which is uh, in the northern tip of Manhattan, a, a unicorn tapestry there. Tapestry, the Cloisters. The unicorn made of stitches by hands by the thousands of hours in Ghent or Bruges or possibly years. The unicorn held in a ring of pickets his beard and buckled collar and blood where they caught him. All around the flowers with the names of Venetian glass, the hellbore and unbidden berries. All around a place they went to day and night, the candles straining the eyes. Skin softened by wool, the sheep in the field, the wolf. At this great distance, the horn is the pinnacle, as tall as the beast is rampant, its tip a single thread squinted over, an instant still flinching. And there's a, a recurring title that I use within this collection, Life of the Mind. Um, so I'm just going to read one of the, the Life of the Mind poems. They're all sort of similarly constructed. Um, and again, draw a bit on found material as well. This is Life of the Mind, Tapestry. One makes a way. It takes the shape of pears, of mammals with spines, of eggs containing mammals that lay eggs. Buds swell to nipples clung to by rain. The true collector detaches the object from its functional relations. The world is present and indeed ordered in each of his objects. Matryoshka dolls rest inside themselves, unshelled. Plush with wet, the mat of astroturf darkens beyond lawn, lives as the tapestry lived when unhung. This world is big and so awake. The tapestry photographed in squares, shifting as it settles, a puzzle undone. Rain stain on the pine. This is life, not your life. Laughter flickers in the bushes. Just try to arrange it. This, uh, this next poem um, is set in, uh, in New York in the, the Frick Collection, which is uh, one of my favorite museums there. And it's, um, I know of you will probably know this already, but it's, it's in a building that at one point was, uh, was someone's private home. Frick Collection. Though there are three Vermeers and such painted plush as into which I would wish to sink my fingers, and an audio guide hush as everyone circulates and closed a stare, the conservatory is the thing, its long tiled pool amidst leaf sheen and the dense resolute scent of forced blooms. Were I there now, I would still want to be there then, morning, hungry, lonely, tongue seared from coffee. If I had such foliage, such waterlit, skylit space in my house, days would still be days, always about the same degree of happy. Sometimes this consoles. After lunch, we, me and my brother, traveling alone together for the first and only time, we went back in and saw it all again, and it was just as good. And afterward, the light along Fifth Avenue sifted, not just through leaves, it was fall, though the mind sets this in spring, but through glass, poised so high it had no need of us. Moving back briefly to zoos, um, all those zoos are kind of in the background all along. Um, I found that one sort of sub subject that interested me was zoos that had been through some kind of transformation or upheaval. So these are 
three zoos to which that applies. Kabul, Afghanistan. This is no zoo, the spot a bomb fell. And these children who file through, shrieking at the shrieking monkeys, are also bombed places. A lion, one-eyed, pools in its infection. China will replace it, plus a pair of peacocks as a bonus. Baghdad, Iraq. Lions snack on military rations U.S. soldiers toss, the lynx last seen roaming an overpass. A sign. Coalition soldiers are securing the area. If you are caught, you will be detained or shot. Please honor your free country. When they arrived, they found three Iraqis apparently mauled. They soon lured the bears to little cages. Aid workers gave them a shower, then fed them a few cabbages. Dhaka, Bangladesh. After the quake, families who visited the zoo on holidays will move into the vacant aviaries. Um, a number of years ago, I had the opportunity of teaching in a creative writing program in um, St. Petersburg, Russia for a couple of weeks in the summer. And this is a program where North American students and faculty basically fly over to have this sort of exotic overseas experience, but we're basically operating within this bubble that we brought with us. Um, so I found that quite disconcerting. And um, in an attempt to get a sense of what life was actually like there, um, you know, this is diluted because of course you can't take a bus tour and find out what life is actually like, but nevertheless, this is the opportunity available to us was something called the Three Villages Tour. We all got up early and drove several hours outside of St. Petersburg and got off the bus and looked at people trying to live their lives who were looking at us. So, um, <laughs> so this is uh, beyond St. Petersburg. Someone translates the kids. Americans eat too much hamburgers. George Bush is a nerd. They gather, watch us, watch them. Not Chernobyl after the disaster. No room strewn with upturned desks and photographs of Lenin, paint peeled in the shapes of republics or animals. The dogs talk back. Chocolate's cheap. The cast-off German tour bus idles while we pay. When in a slur I understand no camera, I zip it up. Fields like home, birch, pine, and near an iron pipe, a woman sits with hacks of meat and what might be an axe, it's hard to tell. How much better if there were no one here, then I could feel how they suffered. So I will read um, one more from this book. Um, this poem has a particular debt to, uh, to Catherine Kidd's work. Um, because I had been reading her bipolar bear piece, and um, the bear that shows up in that poem is the, the Stanley Park Zoo bear in Vancouver, which was also the most potent bear of my childhood. So I had that point of identification, and um, her rhythms just got under my skin as well. So in the, the bear that I was trying to write about, um, which was a, a bear in, um, in the Menagerie in Paris, um, it, the poem started coming out with cat kids rhythms in it and uh, it was fabulous um, so I don't know if this is even really my poem but in any case um, I couldn't not read it today thank you so this is a brief history of the bear pit in the menagerie du jardin des plantes as though the bear were never here in this pit beside the statue of a bear were never more than a snuff and a reference probably wrong we're never down there, nosing the bars, its back water dappled amidst the massacre of chestnut blossoms fallen from a high place that was never grace. Last time a vacant pit and a sign promising next time a red panda, compact of face and almost ursine in its lope. Last time I didn't know that next time I'd hold in my arms a girl who'd hold to her chest a bear in a dress made in China, I'll bet. A bee strung to its back, the better to gather honey, though it's straight to her mouth with the bee, for she who's never seen a being much larger than me, unless you count trees. She can't imagine the bear in its dark never there, though she's heard that song of bears caught unawares in the woods where she mustn't go. Those are bears with bedtimes, bears who are us, and there was never a bear who was not us, not in any old wood, not in that peered into place. I went there when the bear was there. I know, I've got photos to show. Now, not that I'm there, 
I haven't gone back, but online I find in a digital flicker two of them perched in an airy of wood. Now a red panda ambles in a pit beside a statue that attempts to attest to a once there bear. No word of the bear from the war, who did not, it seems, go as I once read, shot dead its head in a Nazi helmet. Though if I tell it enough, it's true, for the girl and me too, the story and this one, buffed, set. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to read a couple of um, individual poems um, written since, since that book, um, and then uh, a small excerpt um, of a, a longer poem that I'm working on now. Um, so I guess if there's a recurring concern here, it's, it's sort of the notion of home. Vespers. Plum brandy, entre chien et loup, uppermost white pine, bequeath. Once the choir in King's College reached such a note together you believed in an elsewhere other than the inside of your head. She's down now, eyes shut, her breathing slow, her feet warm under the alphabet quilt she wanted when the blinds slid together against the light. From much farther out than here, the city illumines the purplish, reddish conflagration of jazz, espresso after dinner, sweat within the elbow. Television in the back neighbor's basement window now is in winter. You never recognize that house from the front. Is home the street you live on, or the house, or the room, or the word, or the first? The place you long for just before you leave. Um, and this poem and the longer piece I'll read um, both touch on or are preoccupied with, really, um, New Orleans. Café du Monde. Years ago, we left late winter for incipient azalea blooms and that river, smaller than imagination and muddier, muddy as the coffee ground with chicory and frothed with milk and poured for us to drink alongside that selfsame river upon which so much depended, though the levee was so high we had to climb the stairs to find it there, that slow gray going somewhere. Cranked open back home, the canister of coffee emanated there, the crinch of our sandals on the powdered sugar floor, the damp curl of hair. It didn't taste the same, though when that can ran out we ordered more and more until the river spilled. Then we ordered more again. The New Orleans of the mind now lives behind a scrim, but still the croak of a fogies when the saints come marching in makes its way across. Meanwhile, really, whatever goes on goes on down there for whoever's left and whoever's come to see what's left. Up here it's about to be winter again, in a vacant lot beside concrete steps that rise five times, then end without an edifice, a little chicory still blooms, blue as nothing. And uh, the last piece I'll read is um, an excerpt from what I think is a book-length project called Long Exposure. Um, it takes as its starting point photographs by um, Robert Polidori, who's a, a Montreal-born photographer known primarily for his series um, of photographs taken in Chernobyl um, and also in uh, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. So um, the, the images that um, show up or that sort of are the ghosts in this particular section are images of ruined interiors. Um, he went into houses that had been boarded up that were basically condemned and... Um, you know, sort of trespassed essentially into these spaces and, and took pictures of what was left. So it's a long exposure after Robert Polidori's photographs after Hurricane Katrina. It begins with a Polidori quote um, where he was paraphrasing the German photographer Dieter Appelt. The snapshot is of a moment that will never occur again, and the long exposure is of a moment that never occurred to begin with. He didn't move the dress moved himself to make the dress the center of regret. He saw it, so we see. The world in the form of a storm sent them out of the room. They ran for their lives. They ran with their lives. They lost their lives or left their lives to fill with water and wind or peel from the walls. What they think of the room, if they think of it, if they have lived to think of it, doesn't look like this. Just ordinary voices, TV, coffee. 
The passport, the jammed bags, the cab ride, the check-in, the bag tag, the wait, the gate, the seat, the takeoff, ice or no ice, the napkin, the bing, the buckle released, the icon for baggage, the bag more battered, the wait, the cab, the ride, the name and the pin, the card in the door, the room with a bed, the light and the sink, the rest, the drive to the room, the room no one's in but the one who's come all this way to be in the room. He went inside and with no power to plug into, he kept the shutter open long enough for the light there was to seal the scene of what there was. What's left is not what was, minus what's gone. Until he presses, nothing happens. When he presses, the nothing affixes. Prints are made of it. We walk into rooms of walls and look into the rooms on walls. The larger the negative, the more. In the print of the wreck of a room, smaller than the room, larger than the mind, are things we wouldn't have seen had we been there. The opening, stemless glasses full of what would stain if spilled. The chatter, this red, how did he get this red? Or this mold is baroque. Or rooms they would not utter. They might go home and hold each other. Not real art, because he just looked, because someone asked for it, because a magazine, because someone paid for it, because he didn't move anything, because he didn't make anything, because many saw it, because there was an opening, because he didn't live there, because it really happened. It wasn't supposed to happen. It keeps happening, the Napalm girl running, screaming, the room breathing in, breathing out. It is happening again. Back on his own dime, he opens the door of a house soft with water, the smell of what it carried rampant, soon the bulldozers. A mirror seeped of its reflection, a dead dog, a dead fridge. He vomits again, opens the shutter and waits. A kitchen scale wavers. In the room he slept in, the mattress, stripped, bears its old stains. In the bar fridge, an orange, drying. Set out beside the sink, a razor, a canister of pent-up froth. Next door is another door. Does he imagine us seeing it, or himself seeing it again? As though rooms know, knew what would become of them, as though they were skins or had skins or eyes or felt anything, as though a dog wandered through and howled and the walls responded and we were the dog, the thing that trespassed, but the only one there to notice was us. Would the one who lived there recognize it on a wall? Before it was a scene, it was a self. Thanks very much. Thank you.